Let me say, <coughs> welcome to Osteo Boston, uh, solution seekers for better bone health. If you're with us tonight in person, welcome. We're thrilled you're here and uh, please stay on because after our speaker finishes, we'll be talking just to you in the second hour. And if you're listening on YouTube, then wonderful and welcome as well. And give us a thumbs up if you liked what you heard tonight and that will let us know how to plan for future content. Also, subscribe to our channel and you'll see more videos just like this one. So I have the privilege tonight of introducing a fabulous speaker. I'm excited about uh, Joan Lappy, uh, PhD, RN and FAAN. She is the Associate Dean of Research uh, and holds the Chris Barron um, Endowed Chair in Creighton University College of Nursing. She's also a Professor of Medicine in the CU Osteoporosis Research Center. She is a Fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. She obtained her PhD from the University of Nebraska College of Nursing and completed her postgraduate training in the CU Osteoporosis Research Center. Her primary research interest is determination of the effects of nutrition on the promotion of bone health and the prevention of osteoporosis. She had continuous funding as a principal investigator from the National Institute of Health from 94 through 2015. And one of her studies showed that vitamin D and calcium supplementation decreased the incidence of stress fractures by 21% in female military re recruits. As a result, the US Navy mandates calcium and vitamin D for all basic trainees. Her research also helped to establish a normal reference for bone mass in children and adolescents. That studies yielded numerous findings that guide clinicians in their care of childhood bone health. She and her team were the first to report findings from a randomized clinical trial of the effects of vitamin D and calcium supplementation on the incidence of all types of cancer in older women. In that study, supplementation decreased the incidence of cancer by 60% over four years. Dr. Laffey was given the Hinshaw Award for the Friends of the National Institute of Nursing in recognition of research that directly improves human health. Other awards include the Outstanding Researcher at Creighton University, the IOTA Tau Outstanding Mentorship, and at CU as well, the Mary Lucretia Creighton Award for creating an environment supportive of achievement for women would you please help me welcome Joan Lappy? And there we go. Oh, <laughs> that didn't do what I meant. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Okay. All right. Can you see the screen? Uh, hold on a second. Yes. Um, Are we good? Is that good? Can you see it well, everyone? Yes. Is there any yes. problem? Yes. Can see All it. good. Yes. All it's good. Cool. Okay, well, I'm really delighted to be here this mm -hmm. evening. And um, uh, from the and I appreciate all the questions you sent. Uh, I, I get the idea. You're a pretty savvy group. And so I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, sharing some of my knowledge with you and also some, um, when I was talking to Shelly before we, um, I prepared this presentation, um, we were talking about some of the research that led to my findings. So I'm going to include some of those stories as we talk tonight and I hope to address all your questions. And um, if not, uh, hopefully be able to be some time at the end of my presentation to cover anything I missed. So let's see if we can get this going down. There we go. So when I was a little girl growing up in rural Nebraska, we didn't worry too much about calcium and vitamin D. Um, we knew that uh, you needed milk, um, 
for healthy bones. And that wasn't a problem because we raised our own dairy cattle and we got milk uh, right there out in the barn. Also, um, I, along with most kids in the U.S. at that time, played outside most of the time. A lot of homes were air conditioned, and it was a lot more fun outside with the other neighborhood kids than it was just hanging around in, uh, inside when we didn't have um, such a wide array of uh, television and video games and so forth. And also, um, it wasn't only rural, rural kids who were drinking milk. At that time, in the general U.S. it was thought that milk was very important for healthy bones, especially for babies and children. And all kids got pretty much exercise, as I mentioned, and along with playing outside, they were exposed to vitamin D from the sunlight. And if they weren't, there were some moms who were there with their cod liver, liver oil. So that is really ancient history, but it was a lot simpler then. So now, if you're reading any social media or looking at magazines or newspapers, you can see that calcium and vitamin D in the news is really controversial. You see conflicting headlines and I've lifted a few before I prepared this presentation and just to review a couple, uh, the first one is pretty uh, uh, negative. It says studies suggest many people in the US are taking too much vitamin D. And another one said, prevent stress fractures, up your calcium and vitamin D. And the third one I thought was kind of judgmental. Older Americans are hooked on vitamins, despite scarce evidence they work, and so on and so forth. So as we're talking today, I'm going to try and give you some background that maybe can help us all try to figure out what the truth is. And I'm not sure I can do all that, but maybe I can give you some insights. So as a nurse and a scientist, I always go back to human physiology. And I think, you know, a lot of physiology is extremely well established. And if the body needs um, certain nutrients to function and work according to its uh, innate physiology, then uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. So looking at calcium physiology, um, Calcium is critical for metabolic functions such as cell signaling, your blood clotting, muscle contraction, nerve function. Then the bone serves as a reservoir of calcium for these functions. So the uh, calcium needed for these functions is carried around in the bloodstream and we talk about serum calcium. And whenever the bloodstream level of calcium falls, calcium is pulled out of the bones. So in order to get adequate calcium, the body depends on dietary cal calcium intake every day to keep that up. If the calcium intake falls below required levels, then calcium is pulled out of that skeletal reservoir. It's sort of like having bone in the bank. So a long-term calcium deficiency depletes that reserve in the bone and subsequently decreases bone mass and strength, which leads to osteoporosis. So vitamin D, we've known for a long time that one of the indirect effects of vitamin D on bone is stimulation of calcium absorption from the intestine, and that's been well established. And in the last 20 years or so, it's been discovered that there are direct effects of vitamin D in the bloodstream, which is 25 OHD. There are direct effects of that vitamin D on bone cells. So we know that vitamin D is important for bone physiology in a couple of different ways. Now, calcium and vitamin D are both threshold nutrients, and I, I think you're aware of that because we talk about required levels. Now, those intake cutoffs are very well established for calcium. And in fact, the center in which I've done my research was actively involved in that, and I'll tell you the story of that uh, in just a minute. Now, recommended vitamin D intakes are established for skeletal health. And we know pretty much what they have to be, but they're not established for non-skeletal health benefits. And as you've read in the last decade or so, there have been a lot of non-skeletal effects of vitamin D that have been discovered. 
The best sort of source of uh, calcium is foods because they contain co-nutrients that are needed for bone and for general health. And as you know, calcium is available in a lot of foods, primarily dairy foods and in lesser amounts from some vegetables. And there are also many fortified foods. Vitamin D is available from sunlight without sunscreen, but there are very few foods that contain high levels of vitamin D. So this is one of the stories I was gonna tell. I had the good um, fortune to work with Dr. Robert Haney, who has done a lot of premium work in calcium balance, which is basically figuring how much calcium you need to take in um, and use without excreting it. So um, back in the 1970s, he wanted to do a very good study of women because they had a higher risk of osteoporosis on calcium balance. And he needed a compliant group. And he also needed women who could come into the hospital for an eight day stay. They could they were up and about, and, and uh, but the main thing was we had to measure their every bit of their calcium intake and output. So he thought around and he thought, well, who would be a more compliant group than Roman Catholic nuns? So he recruited 130 Roman Catholic nuns to the something that uh, to a study that came to be known as the Omaha Nun Study. And they were premenopausal. They didn't have a very high calcium intake because in those days, the recommended levels hadn't been figured out yet. And that's why he was doing the study. So before they came into the hospital, the dietitian would work with each of these women to talk about what they usually ate. And then each woman was given a menu for the meals throughout the day and she was fed that same menu for eight days so that there was consistency in her diet it was all part of the study design. And then calcium content was measured in all the intake and all the output. So that was one reason they had to stay in the hospital because they were fed the food and they had to lick their plates literally so that they got every bit of food because that the content, uh, the calcium content of that food had been calculated. And then all feces and urine were measured. So it was really quite a complex study. And so when he talked about calcium balance, that was the dietary calcium intake minus what came out in the urine and the stool. And that was um, designated as the amount of calcium the body needed. And at the end of that study, what he found was that the intake that would produce an average balance of zero, which is what you're going for, was about 1,200 milligrams a day. And that was used to help establish recommended intakes that we still use today. So this study actually lasted 45 years. Um, and this is a picture of this Dr. Haney who did the study and his predecessor a successor, uh, Dr. Recker and Dr. Recker's wife. And then here we have uh, the nurse, Rita Ryan, who was the project nurse on that study for the entire 45 years. And this shows four of the nuns who were still alive and participating at the 40th anniversary. As you can three, see, three still were wearing their original uh, Roman Catholic habits but one of them had gotten more progressive and was wearing street clothes. So it was a very famous study and uh, made a difference in what we know about calcium intake and calcium balance and the importance. So this slide shows the current recommended calcium and vitamin D recommended intakes that were established by the Institute of Medicine. And now that's known as the National Academy of Medicine. And so you can see for females 51 and older, the recommendation is 1200 milligrams a day. Now, vitamin D, I said um, that recommendations have been established for bone health. And for that, the Institute of uh, Medicine, uh, National Academy of Science recommends 600 international units a day for almost 
all age groups except those over 70 where they rec recommend 800. Now, I think what's important to know that we don't hear a lot about is something called the upper tolerable limits of safety. And what that is, and again, it comes from the National Academy, that is the highest amounts you could take in on a daily basis without risking a major side effects. And for calcium for older people, that's 2000 milligrams a day. For vitamin D, it's 4,000 international units a day. Now we talk about food sources of calcium, and I think a lot of you know this, dairy is the best source. For those who are lactose intolerant, there are a lot of lactose-free foods. And there are many calcium fortified products. And when were those were first coming on the market, Dr. Haney and our team studied a lot of these products uh, one of the first ones to come out was a fortified orange juice, and there were many others after that. And we found that all those foods um, uh, had calcium that was well absorbed. You know, the fortified calcium uh, was it turned into something very useful for the body. And you know that a lot of vegetables have calcium, and I know from your questions, you also know that a lot of those vegetables have oxalate which kind of binds the calcium and makes it not very available for the body. So um, a, a scientist by the name of Connie Weaver did a lot of work with Dr. Haney to determine how much calcium was available from vegetables. And um, so for example, she found, for example, that to get 300 milligrams of calcium from beans, 300 is what you get from a glass of milk. So to get 300 milligrams of calcium from beans, you would need to eat 12 cups of beans. So that's a lot of beans. And I would recommend that if you do that, you might want to take bean oil too. And so for broccoli, she found you would need to take six cups of broccoli to get the equivalent of one glass of milk. So vegetables are good for many reasons and they do contribute to your calcium balance but it in smaller amounts then someone had a, a, a good point about labels provide just the percent of calcium per day and how do you figure out how many milligrams that is and that that's a very good question so for calcium the labels uh, the calcium listed on the food label is based on a thousand milligrams a day so I pulled out a label here, and this shows this particular product. If you have one serving, that is equivalent to 25% of your daily value of calcium. So to figure out how many milligrams of calcium that is, you would take 25% times 1,000 milligrams. And in other words, it would be 250 milligrams. So if you saw something that had 7%, calcium of the daily value, you would just multiply 0.07 times 1,000 to get 70. So this person also asked about other foods. And I had to reach out to a dietitian who tells me that most food labels for things other than calcium gives the amount of the daily value in milligrams or whatever measure. And if it doesn't, you probably have to talk with a nutritionist to find out exactly what that dose is. Or um, you could do like I do to start with in Google and see what you can find out. So just a summary of this beginning conversation, well-established physiology supports the importance of adequate calcium and vitamin D for your bone health. Calcium intake thresholds are very well-established. Now, recommendations for vitamin D intake are based on meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. So let me define a couple things in case you don't know. A randomized controlled trial is a human study where some people are assigned to take one thing and other people are assigned to take another thing. So in many of these randomized trials, one group was assigned to take uh, vitamin D and another group was assigned to 
take a placebo, although the pills look alike. So the individuals don't know which one they're getting. So those are randomized controlled trials. And a meta-analysis just means that um, experts look at groups of randomized trials to see what their findings are and to try to make sense by analyzing all these different studies together. Calcium is best obtained from foods. Use supplements to fill the gap to reach the recommended intake, and that's why we call them supplements. Now, there is a nifty little calcium calculator on the Bone Health Foundation website if you want to estimate how much calcium you are getting from your foods. So just go to the bone health and osteoporosis.org under patients and you'll come across the, the vitamin, uh, the calcium calculator. So there were some other questions related to calcium that I thought I'd address right away. The question was, do you need to wait four hours after taking calcium in order to eat or to take more calcium so that you get the best benefit from your dose? The major thing we have found in repeated studies is that calcium should be at least taken a couple times a day, some in the morning and some in the afternoon. So that first dose gets absorbed throughout the day. And by the time you're getting low, you take another one that will get you through the night. Um, and it is best to take calcium with food. Now I'm, I'm going to skip in that kind of answers the question whether you should take it in the morning or the evening. And I it's really both. Now, another good question was calcium citrate versus calcium carbonate. It's true that calcium citrate does not need to be taken with food to be well absorbed, but calcium carbonate does. Um, calcium citrate actually has some acidic um, it's, it's a little bit acid, like the stomach uh, is when it's digesting foods. And so the absorption starts faster. With calcium carbonate, it helps to eat a little bit of food, even a cracker, you don't have to eat much, but something to get the gastric acid going so it starts to digest the calcium supplement. So that we usually just say, take whichever you prefer. And it's always good to take a little bit of food with any kind of pill to get that digestive machinery started, unless it's some kind of pill or medicine that is recommended to be taken on an empty stomach. So another person had a question about slow release calcium supplements. And there's little evidence about absorption of those. Technically, if you take a calcium pill, it really is somewhat slow release because it takes a while for it to break down, to be absorbed, and then to be active. So I know of no evidence that shows that a slow release calcium supplement would be any better in any way compared to your regular calcium supplements. We do know that if you take a chewable um, especially like chewable calcium carbonate, that is broken down immediately. And so there is pro uh, probably faster uh, efficacy in getting that into your bloodstream and working. Then another very good question, should you take supplements that contain other things like vitamin D? Um, again, I don't know of any evidence to support that. But it makes sense that if you took calcium and vitamin D together, they may work together more like food. But again, the evidence is lacking to really support that. Um, the main thing is if you're taking several different supplements, make sure you're not getting too much of any particular vitamin or mineral. Now, uh, it's hard to find a calcium supplement without vitamin D. So you're getting maybe some vitamin D in your calcium supplement. You might be getting vitamin D in a multiple vitamin and there are other uh, types of um, over-the-counter things that have vitamin D in them. So know what you're getting in total so that you don't get too much. As far as the quality of a brand, um, that's kind of hard to determine these days. Early on, Dr. Haney was um, paid by several companies to test the bioavailability 
of their calcium supplements. And many of the better known brands that we tested were very well absorbed and utilized, but no one's doing the kind of work that Dr. Haney was doing. So I think the important thing is to, if you aren't getting enough calcium from your diet, take a supplement and um, also have your bone density measured to see um, what that is so that you can kind of work with your provider to make sure you're optimizing your nutrition. Uh, now, this was kind of scary because uh, someone's uh, doctor recommended no more than 800 milligrams a day because uh, of a propensity towards kidney stones. And I think that's what a good provider would probably do is to be a little bit aware of your calcium, especially supplements, if you're a stone former. And so um, usually calcium in the diet does not contribute to uh, kidney stones, especially if you're disdain within the recommended levels. But listen to your providers if you're a stone former or person who has propensity towards kidney stones. Then the Next question was about the calcium score in a blood test. So that refers to your uh, serum calcium levels. Uh, and how does that relate to the requirements for calcium intake? Well, if you've been following the physiology, you, you probably won't notice much different in your serum calcium from um, your diet. You could maybe eat a half a gallon of ice cream and a whole bunch of milk and cheese and all this calcium. And it really won't show up in your serum calcium because what is not needed immediately by your body is excreted in the urine or stored in the bone. So there really is no direct relationship between that calcium score and the dietary calcium you take in. And another question that was reflected in a lot of concern in the US and that's, can calcium added by food or supplements uh, cause arterial blockage? And there've been a lot of studies on that. And so I went back to see what the most recent uh, evidence is saying. And I found a, a very nice review of previous studies that was, published by uh, two well-known uh, nutrition researchers, Dr. Taylor Wallace and Connie Weaver. And uh, this is a quote from uh, what they summarized, the hypothesis that calcium supplements may have a causal inference on cardiovascular events is based on very weak evidence and um, really does not support any public policy or guidelines. More importantly, the hypothesis currently lacks biological plausibility and is likely a methodological confound. Again, experts were trying to define a lot of studies and these were not the primary outcomes of studies. They were kind of looking at secondary analysis. So at this time, there is no evidence that recommended levels of calcium or vitamin D can lead to arterial calcification. So I'm gonna to switch to vitamin D and talk a, a, a little bit more about it and some of its non-skeletal effects since I did some studies in that area and I just find it fascinating and I'm hoping you will. Now, it's interesting, vitamin D isn't a typical nutrient. Uh, nutrients defined as a food or biochemical substance that's used by the body that must be supplied from outside the body in adequate amounts from foods consumed. Now, nature's way of providing vitamin D has been uh, historically through exposure to sunlight. There's something called 7D hydrocholesterol in your skin that absorbs solar ultraviolet radiation and then it's converted to vitamin D3. Now there is a small amount of vitamin D available in foods, but it's pretty hard to get. Even with salmon, the best source of vitamin D in a food is ocean raised salmon. Even um, lake raised salmon does not have as much as ocean raised. And uh, other foods have really small amounts and not enough, to, uh, even if you're really trying to get all your vitamin D from diet, it'd be pretty hard to do. And interestingly, vitamin D is actually kind of a, a 
a type of steroid that has an endocrine function and mechanism of action. So I always like to go back and kind of tell the story of the vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, the vitamin D. Um, so our ancestors who were raised around the equator got plenty of sunlight year round and they, they had a lot of skin exposed. So they probably were adequate in vitamin D. So that scientists like to think about what occurred in nature that is probably the way things should be. So some innovative scientists decided to try and figure out what those early hunter-gatherers might have had as a serum 25 hydroxy D level. So they stubbled, studied some of the Maasai tribesmen in Africa. These people still are hunter-gatherers, although they look like they're, they wear more clothes, but they still have a lot of sun exposure uh, year round. And they're average of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is a blood measurement of your vitamin D status, was 42 nanograms per mil. Now we're going to talk about what the guidelines say, but that's higher than any current guidelines right now would recommend. So unlike our ancestors, we're inside a lot more and we really get sunlight. Um, sometimes we have to work at it. And when we do, we usually apply sunscreen. So we avoid photo aging and uh, skin cancers. However, if used appropriately, sunscreen will block out about 95 to 98 percent of that vitamin D forming action of sunshine. So if you uh, wear sunscreen, as you should, you're probably not making any vitamin D. Now I've kept talking about 25 hydroxy vitamin D. If you went to your provider and wanted to know your vitamin D status, this is what they would measure. 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And there are many things that affect how much vitamin D you take in translates to higher serum 25 hydroxy D. So two of us might take the same dose of a vitamin D supplement and end up with a different 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. And that's due to things like obesity. People who are uh, obese or very overweight have been shown to need more vitamin D supplements to raise their 25 hydroxy D than people who weigh less. Similarly, we have different genetic makeups that determine how we convert supplements to serum 25D. And also there's variability and absorption among folks. In addition, conversion from the skin from sunlight varies among people. For example, the older we are, the less we can convert in our skin. Um, the darker the skin, the less vitamin D is converted because of the melanin in the skin that causes the darkness. Uh, as I mentioned, the use of sunscreen will decrease how much vitamin D we can make. And of course, how much we make depends on the latitude and the season. Here, at we're about at the, I think we're about the 38th parallel. And uh, we have shown that in this parallel between the middle of October and the middle of March, we would not make um, very any vitamin D in our skin, even if we had a lot of skin exposed. In fact, uh, Dr. Michael Hollick, who, is, who still is and a vitamin D researcher in Boston, had one of his graduate students go out in a swimsuit in the middle of winter on a very, very sunny day to test how much vitamin D was converted from the sunlight, and it was none. So don't plan on vitamin D from the sunlight in the northern latitudes in the winter. So there are different recommendations for blood levels of serum 20, of 25 hydroxy D for bone health. The Endocrine Society that really has a lot of interest in bone health says that vitamin D deficiency is below 20. Insufficiency is between 21 and 29. Uh, the US uh, National Academy of Science says anything up to uh, below 20 is being deficient and anything above 20 is adequate. So there's, there's differences of opinion. 
So the vitamin D receptor is found in nearly every cell of the body. And if you have a receptor on a cell for something, it implies that that cell needs that chemical, that substance, whatever it is. So nearly every cell has vitamin D receptors. So that observation indicates that the role of vitamin D is not limited only to bone and mineral metabolism. Bone cells do have VDRs, but so do many other cells in the body. So I have been very interested in several studies of the anti-cancer effects of vitamin D. And so I'm just gonna to touch on that. I hope you don't mind that, um, but it, I think it relates to all of us. Um, when I started uh, looking at this, numerous observational studies have shown that higher vitamin D intake and higher serum 25D were associated with lower incidence of cancer. And there were a few observational studies that sh didn't show this relationship, but most of them showed no harm from vitamin D. Basic science studies have identified mechanisms by which vitamin D signaling likely decreases cancer development. And like I said before, when you can actually see the physiology of something working, it gives you more uh, confidence that it really is having an effect. For example, we know that vitamin D is important in the immune response, and the immune response is important for preventing early cancers. Uh, vitamin D also uh, slows down metastasis and has a, a myriad of, of other biochemical actions that are known to either prevent or to slow the rate of cancer, in some cases to eradicate early cancers. Now, although we do all these randomized trials of nutrients, they're not really appropriate because you can't really get a true placebo group. Now, if we were studying a medication for blood pressure and we said to half of the people have to take the blood pressure med and half of the people take a placebo, we'd be confident that only the people in the, the blood pressure med group got it. The people in the placebo group wouldn't accidentally be taking blood pressure medicine. But with nutrients, you can't do that because even though I can, sign, can uh, assign one group to take vitamin D, they're still gonna get some vitamin D from sunlight. They're gonna get some in their food and they might accidentally get some in some other supplements. However, there's a conundrum here because these randomized trials are required by the experts who establish public policy with regard to intake of nutrients. So the experts who decide on the guidelines need randomized trials of nutrients. And they, we all do the best with those constraints that we can. So in the early um, 2000s, I did a study that didn't work out, but it turned out uh, to be a, a silver lining. Um, it was funded to look at the effects of calcium and vitamin D malnutrition in postmenopausal women. And we wanted to determine if we supplemented people with calcium and vitamin D, could we prevent osteoporotic fractures? And so we did a randomized trial because that's what you had to do. And we had 1,800 postmenopausal women who lived in rural Nebraska and they were over 50. And we assigned them to one of two, three groups. One group we asked to take calcium and vitamin D. Another group we asked to take calcium only. And the other group placebo. No, and the pills were all matched. So they didn't know which group they were in. <coughs> and we followed them for four years. And so... Um, unfortunately, during that four years, the first drug ever approved by the FDA for osteoporosis was approved, and it completely bollocked our study. Because of what we did at the beginning of our study, we did a bone density measurement, and then we followed women along the way to see if their bone density got better or worse, and to see if they had any fractures. Well, ethically, once there was a medication available for um, bones uh, in people who had low bone mass, 
anyone who we screened with a DEXA and we found to have a low BMD, we had to send to their private provider to be treated. So it completely messed up our study. But as I said, there was a silver lining because uh, there were other things we could learn from this study. And you know, when you have a large study where 1800 people volunteered their time and their blood and, and whatever, uh, you look to see if there's anything else you can learn. And what we did find is that there was an anti-cancer effect. So what this graph shows basically, it's called a survival curve. And so this line represents over the course of four years, which, how many, uh, what proportion of the people in the placebo group survived without cancer. It's basically what this graph says. This line shows the number of people in the calcium only group who survived without getting cancer. And the last line represents the calcium and vitamin D group. And so what this shows when we analyze the numbers, the group who took calcium and vitamin D had a 60% lower risk of developing a cancer during study than the placebo group. And this was very stati highly statistically significant. Uh, when we talk about statistical significance in human studies, uh, we usually talk about a p-value below 0.5, and this was 0.1. So 60% lower. So then I took those finds that was really well heralded because it was the first time anyone had ever looked in a randomized trial uh, to see what vitamin D and calcium might do to prevent cancer. So that was called a secondary outcome though because that study was planned to look at osteoporotic fractures. So to convince um, scientists, uh, I got another grant from the National Cancer Institute to do a study where the primary outcome was cancer. And we designed the study pretty similarly, only this time there were 2,300 women, and we only had two groups, vitamin D and calcium, and or, or the other group got placebo. And again, we followed them for four years. We did this in Eastern Nebraska, and we had, we almost, had people in a third of the state. Each of those starred counties was one of our study areas. It was population based, and we had four centers from which we managed the study. So it was it was pretty complex. And what this table shows is serum twenty five D levels and the standard deviation. So in the placebo group and the active group. So. Both of them at their first visit before we gave them anything had fairly high serum 25 levels. They were both, both about 33. And then we tested their blood levels every year to make sure the group got active. Vitamin D actually increased their serum 25 and they did. And after uh, the first year of study and on through that, the, the vitamin D group was always significantly higher in their serum 25 than in the group who was taking the placebo. They stayed about the same. So that was important that we knew if we found some effects, it wasn't just who took the vitamin D and who didn't. We, could, we knew that the people who were taking vitamin D on average had higher serum levels of it. So 90% of our people finished the study. There were 109 cancers, and there were all types of cancers. Breast was the most prominent, which is, and then colon and rectal, and that's kind of uh, typical of what you see in a general population. So this shows the outcome of that study. It's a different type of figure, though. So the red line represents those who got cancer during four years of study compared to the blue line uh, that, and the placebo group compared to the blue line that represents people who developed cancer over four years in the vitamin D and calcium group. And in this case, there was a 30% a lower incidence of cancer in the vitamin D group than in the placebo group. But scientifically, it did not reach 
statistical significant. Instead of being 0.05 or less, it was 0.06. So it came very close, but I think the problem probably was we did not have a large enough sample size considering that these women had really high levels of serum 25 at the beginning of the study. So they were already pretty healthy as far as their vitamin D status. So then we took another look, uh, excluding the cancers that occurred during the first year of study, because if you think about it, you don't take vitamin D on one day and the next day you change your cancer risk. Uh, it, comes over a period of time. So if we looked at only those who developed cancer after the end of year one, uh, there was a statistically significant difference in the incidence. It was a 35% biological difference and it was slightly statistical, statistically significant, just a little bit under 0.05. So you can see that 0.05, it seems kind of arbitrary but you have to do when you're working with the mathematics of analysis, you have to have some cutoffs. Um, but when you think about it from a more pragmatic approach, you think, well, if it's 0.061 or 0.059, how much difference does that mean really? So after our study, there was a really definitive trial that really just kind of left us in the dust. It was called VITAL, it was funded by the federal uh, government and it was um, the PI was out of, of Harvard. And it was a randomized trial of over 27, 25,000 adults. And they assigned people again to 2000 international units of vitamin D or placebo, but they didn't use calcium. They did ask people to take calcium supplements on their own. And what this one found is that there were 793 cancers in the vitamin D group compared to 824 in the placebo group. So there were fewer cancers in the vitamin D group, but it did not, it was not statistically significant. So it was considered not effective. But what we don't read about in the findings from Vital is that there was a 17% reduction in cancer deaths which I think is an important outcome uh, because obviously it's, it's affecting cancer some, uh, somewhere along the line if people, not as many people are dying from it. And it, the study importantly also found that African-Americans assigned to the vitamin D group did experience a 23% reduction in cancer risk. Now, African-Americans, because of their darker skin, typically have lower levels of um, serum 25D. Now, we believe that when you're doing studies of vitamin D, 25D is a better indicator of vitamin D status that rather than whether you were in the supplemented group or in the placebo group. And for the reasons I've described, these nutrients aren't well uh, suited for randomized trials. Um, serum 25 turns out to be a better predictor uh, because it accounts for all vitamin D sources. So if you're in the treatment group, it'll show the effects of the supplement you took, of the vitamin D you got, of the food you took. And similarly, for the placebo group, we can see what their real vitamin D status is. Even though they took a placebo supplement, they're going to have vitamin D in their bloodstream. And uh, using the serum 25 overcomes the biases of treatment compliance because as scientists, we know that people don't take all the pills we ask them to. It's a burden. And sometimes they tell us they don't take them. And sometimes they don't tell us that. That's just a given. And also measuring serum 25 allows for variability in dose response which is what I talked about before, how two people can take the same amount of vitamin D, but end up with different 25D levels. So based on that, we did another analysis. And what this, the red line is what's important. And down here, we're looking as you go farther to the right, it shows higher levels of serum 25 from way below 20 to above 80. So in our this last study I talked about, we took the blood from 
everyone, both groups, whether they took vitamin D supplements or whether they didn't. And we measured their 25D and then calculated the cancer risk based on people in our study who got cancer. So what this shows is those who had higher levels of serum 25D had a lower risk of developing cancer in our study. And that risk was about 35% lower and um, it was statistically significant. The risk of the high versus the low. Now in here, what we looked at is this narrow range when you have these black lines, those show how much variation there is around the average. And so in statistical terms, we're not as confident as these numbers as we are here because there's a very tight range around the average in this level of measurement. So what we found when we looked at this area is that people who had a uh, blood level of serum 25 of 55 had a 35% lower risk of developing cancer in our study than people who had a serum level of 30. And that risk was 35% lower here than it was for these group, which we thought was really fascinating because none of the recommendations for serum levels of vitamin D um, for bone health would be above 30. So it kind of raised a question of, do we need higher levels of serum 25 for an anti-cancer effect? Now, the, this study uh, was published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and, and uh, they wouldn't agree to publish the serum findings in the journal only as a supplement available online. And the conclusion that they had a straw from the major study because the group by group comparison did not reach statistical significance. Remember it was 0.06. They had us conclude that vitamin D did not have an effect on cancer, even though there was a 35% lower risk in the supplemented group. Biologically, there was an effect, but not statistically. So you can see some of the day-to-day -day frustrations that scientists have, and somehow we have to figure out the truth from all of that. So just to wrap up the findings of this cancer study among healthy, whoops, sorry, among healthy older women with the mean baseline of, of serum 25 of 33, Supplementation with vitamin D3 and calcium compared with placebo resulted in a 30% lower risk of all type cancer at four years, but did not reach statistical significance. Serum 25 significantly predicted risk of cancer when we just looked at the blood of all the people together and compared with those with a 25D of 30, the estimated risk for cancer incidence at 55 was 35% lower. Then one more study we did with these data and then I'll move on to something else. Um, we combined the data from these two studies of mine with some data from grassroots, uh, uh, grassroots Health. And um, all the women were over the age of 50, none had had cancer before. And we looked at their 25 D levels over the course of four years and the risk of breast cancer, only breast cancer. So we had over 5,000 women and they had a nice range of, of 25D concentrations. Now this is a real busy slide, but again, we're looking at the same thing, serum 25 levels going up and the risk of cancer. So in this group, the higher the serum 25, the lower the risk of breast cancer. And in fact, the analysis showed that there was an 82% lower cancer incidence rate for those who had serum 25 equal to or above 60 than those who were less than 20. So 
doing a lot of work with vitamin D and cancer, there are many of us who really feel strongly that there is something going on there that's positive. And um, so there were 48 scientists who were experts in vitamin D who contributed to and signed a call to action. And I disclose I'm one of the 48. And the whole call to action white paper you can find at grassrootshealth.net. But basically what we said that there have been many uh, associations found between vitamin D insufficiency and other diseases besides osteoporosis. And based on that evidence, we think action is urgent and that we could actually uh, reduce the incidence of many of these other illnesses, um, um, things like the common cold and COVID and um, um, many other diseases if we could only eradicate some of this vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency. So the call to action was issued to alert the public to the importance of having serum 25 levels between 40 and 60. So this is the only group to my knowledge that has come out with a recommendation for where you might have uh, for a range of healthy serum 25 for disorders other than osteoporosis. But those are not national guidelines. This was simply a call to action by scientists who work in vitamin D. And as I said, you can find more uh, available at grassrootshealth.net. So to close on that, basic science studies have firmly established the effect of vitamin D on most body systems. Randomized trials really aren't appropriate for studying nutrients because there isn't really a true placebo group. And guidelines are developed by experts reviewing and drawing conclusions primarily from randomized clinical trials. And they do the best they can based on what they're told to do. And in addition, they're required to factor in the financial cost of instituting the guidelines, for example, costs to Medicare. So most guidelines have some cost built into it. So they're trying to balance the best thing for our human people, and at the same time, not spend too much money on healthcare. So they're trying to balance the two, and I'm not being critical. That's a very difficult job, and we want them to be parsimonious and, and use money well and to do the best they can for our US citizens. Sunlight is a natural source of vitamin D, but most persons don't get enough and supplements are inexpensive and safe. Okay, so I had some questions related to vitamin D and I pretty well answered the one about vitamin D and arterial blockages. The way vitamin D would contribute to blockages would be through calcium. And as I said before, there really is no evidence that calcium or vitamin D have an effect on arterial calcification. Um, and this person asked, do you recommend testing both active D and storage D? The true measurement of vitamin D status is measuring that 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And taking vitamin D in the morning or evening, um, really, I don't know of any evidence that shows that one is better than the other. Uh, I think it makes some sense to take it with calcium uh, or with food. Uh, just as I said before, any pills taken with food probably are digested faster. And the optimal amount of vitamin D to take really is highly variable, and it depends on what you're getting your serum 25D to. A lot of times what the provider will do is start you on a vitamin D supplement, maybe maybe a thousand a day or 2000 and then have you come back in two months and see what your level of serum 25 is. And sometimes I know in our clinic, sometimes we have to keep raising the dosage. Maybe we've got somebody who's overweight. Maybe we've got somebody who just doesn't utilize vitamin D very well. So it's kind of, um, it's just professional um, working around to try to figure and get to the right dose. But interesting now, and it's, uh, the grassroots health net, net is real interesting and has an interesting history if you wanted to go on and read it, but they have a lot of information about vitamin D and I did find that they have a vitamin D calculator. 
But in order to calculate how much vitamin D you need to take, you would need to know your current serum 25D level. Actually, uh, for a small fee, they will actually set on a home kit and you can actually prick your finger and send in a blood spot and they can measure your vitamin D and it is a valid measure of vitamin D. But this is what the calculator would have you put in. Uh, your current serum level, your weight, how much supplement you're taking now, and what your desired serum level would be. Let's say after the talk today, you decided you want to keep your serum 25D level at 30 nanograms. Well, then you would plug in that desired serum level. But again, you would need to know your current serum level. And then that calculator would show you probably what you about what you need to take on a daily basis in supplementation to get your blood level where you want it. However, it's also best always to work with a provider on these things. Now, there's there was concern raised way back in 2011 about kidney stones and calcium and vitamin D and that there was a study, the Women's Health Initiative, where they gave one group uh, calcium 500 milligrams and vitamin D 400 international units. And I want to point out, and I'm sure you see, these are kind of low doses. Calcium is recommended at least 1,000 most adults and 1,200 in older people. And vitamin D in older people is usually recommended about 600 to 800. But th this study found a statistically significant 17% greater incidence of kidney stones in the group that got the supplement compared to placebo. And that got a lot of attention. Calcium and vitamin D cause kidney stones. However, when they went back and reanalyzed and they just looked at the people in the study who took at least 80% of the supplements, that means that's the people who were taking the pills, the difference was no longer statistically significant. So really this was a, a lack of evidence of kidney stones uh, related to calcium and vitamin D. But it still um, kind of hangs out there and there are still people, and including scientists, who have that concern. In neither of my studies did we find a problem with kidney stones. We had a few people who developed kidney stones, but it was in keeping with what you would expect in populations of people. There are people who get kidney stones, even if they're not taking supplements. So switching to protein, which is another really important nutrient for bone health, and it helps to prevent osteoporosis. Protein actually makes up about 50% of the volume of bone. And this electron microscope photo shows normal bone here and osteoporotic here. Now, if you were falling off your bike, you'd rather have bone that looks as strong than this strong. But this is called, we call this sort of a scaffolding. And it's made up of hydroxyapatite and calcium is laid down to make that bone strong. But the actual scaffolding is made up of protein. So you can see where protein is important. And a daily supply of dietary protein and protein is needed because the body isn't storing protein uh, that ca it can use for the bone. So you need some protein every day. And research has um, found quite a few things about bone and protein. Um, it helps prevent age-related bone loss, reduces hip fracture. Intake levels between 1.2 and 2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day are needed for older adults to have adequate protein. And a lot of older people don't get enough protein. Sometimes I don't know if it's a lack of appetite or if it's worried uh, about animal fat. I don't know what the reasons are, but study after study shows that older people take less protein uh, than younger people. Now, higher intakes of dietary protein have no bad effect on bone. For a while, we did think that maybe protein caused us to lose calcium in the urine, but studies have shown now there's no bad effect of protein on bone. And there's no detriment to bone mineral density or increased fractures resulting from consumption of animal 
versus plant protein. So as far as bone is concerned, both are e equally good. But there are risks of a high protein diet. Um, it, high protein intakes uh, present the potential for significant harm in individuals with chronic kidney disease. And so people, those people should avoid high protein diets. Now, kidney function decreases with age in everybody. And many older adults have some decreased kidney function and they may not even be aware of it. If you see a provider regularly every year, they're probably doing the blood test to determine what your kidney function is. So it's easy to find out out. But it's always best to confer with your provider if you're considering a protein intake that is at the higher levels of recommendation. Now, high protein diets have also been associated uh, with an increased risk of kidney stones in some studies. Um, so anybody who's had kidney stones before should be somewhat careful with their protein intake too. And again, work with your provider on making decisions about increasing protein. And I've got another calculator. I'm giving you so many calculators here. Um, so this is to calculate target protein intake. So as I said before, experts recommend that older people should have between 1.2 and 2 grams per kilogram per day for elderly people or older people. Um, and if you're more physically active, studies show you need more protein. So to estimate your target for total grams of protein intake per day, here's what you have to do first. And people can have copies of this presentation so you can have all these calculations if you're at all interested in them. First, you divide your weight in pounds by 2.2 and that gets your weight in kilograms. Then you multiply your target intake per kilo by your weight. So let's say you decide you want to have your protein about 1.5. It's a little bit higher than the low recommendation and kind of in the middle, 1.5 um, grams per kilo per day. And you multiply that then by your weight in kilos. And so for a person who weighs 56 kilos, who wants to shoot for about 1.5 grams per kilo per day, that would be 84 grams of protein per day. I'm not giving a test, so don't worry about that. And now a lot of you voice uh, questions about magnesium, which is really important for many body functions, uh, muscle, nerve function, bone health. Chronically low levels can increase the risk of high blood pressure, heart disease, type two diabetes, and osteoporosis. Now the recommended intake for women is about a little over 300 milligrams per day. Now the thing about magnesium, ingesting higher levels can be harmful. And someone uh, submitted a question or a comment that her provider had had her taking 800 milligrams a day for bone health and she ended up with stomach problems. So you do, you want to be careful about getting too much magnesium, similarly to getting too little. You want to keep probably a little bit under the top is better than going over and getting high levels. And uh, many foods can take magnesium and food intake is always safer than supplements. On, again, on grassroots.net, there's a nice thing on their blog with a lot of information about magnesium that's based on solid science. So I, I found a list of foods that have magnesium and I, this is about a third of the list. But I, as I was reading about it, I got concerned about my magnesium and I thought, geez, I wonder if I'm getting enough. But as I look at these things, I picked out some foods that I probably eat some of these every day. And if I added it up, I, I'm pretty sure I get my 310 milligrams a day for my diet. And so I would suggest that you kind of look at what you're usually eating and find out whether you think you've got enough magnesium. A blood test can be done to see what your magnesium level is, but then I also read that sometimes 
that doesn't give you an accurate reading. So that's kind of concerning. And I have to disclose magnesium is not my area of expertise, but uh, looking at fairly reliable sources, that's the information I have. So if I were making a recommendation, I'd say try to get adequate amounts from your food. But there may be some people who do need supplementation, but you don't want high levels. So a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. You've been a patient audience on Zoom. You don't get much of a choice, I guess. Um, but somebody asked about probiotics. And that's a great question. Probiotics are really coming into their own and they have many health benefits. But as of today, there really haven't been studies in humans. There have been some animal studies that showed that probiotics may uh, contribute to bone density, but uh, the human studies have not been done. Uh, and then somebody asked about all those other nutrients. There are a lot of nutrients that are important for general health and for bone health, uh, but the important ones are calcium and vitamin D and protein. Um, and the other nutrients, many of them you just get through eating a fairly well-balanced diet and probably none of them have as major effect as those leading ones that I mentioned. Uh, and then there was a question about soaking vegetables uh, uh, to get rid of the oxalate. I have to admit, I don't know about that. I don't know if people have determined you can get more calcium from beans after you soak them. Uh, but, and so there may be some studies out there that show that, I don't know, but it does seem like a lot of work to me. But uh, if that was something you wanted to do, I'm afraid I don't have much information on the value. Uh, and then someone shared that she's um, read that Reclast, which is a bisphosphonate that's given uh, for bone density that attacks the kidneys, and it does. In fact, you have to have a certain level of kidney function before your provider will prescribe any of the bisphosphonates. And in fact, many medications can affect kidney function. Uh, and it's always important to work with your provider to ask that question. But adjusting the diet is not something that should be done. Um, calcium and vitamin D at adequate levels are both important for reclass to work. Uh, and usually they're just at the recommended level. So my advice to you is to work with your provider on what you have in your diet and especially on any supplements. And then someone else was starting on for tail, which is also a medication that's given that really builds up bone fast and, and quite to quite a degree. Um, and some people get nausea from this. And the question was, could that be um, because there's too much calcium? Well, high levels of serum calcium, where they're really, um, what do I want to say, above normal, can cause nausea, but that's not what's causing the nausea from Forteo. It's probably just mostly the inflammation that results, the inflammatory response that uh, occurs after taking the medication. 7.22 p.m. And um, the bone pain from too much vitamin D, uh, I'm not aware of any evidence to that. And drinking more water is always good um, for maintaining health and kidney function. So in closing, I just say that obtaining adequate nutrition for bone health as well as general health is best through food intake. Nutrients interact with each other in good ways that individual supplements can't. But you know, when you're thinking about how to get your nutrients, make sure it's, your source is effective, that it's safe, efficient, and hopefully it's tasty. And I'm not going to go over this, uh, but I'm so glad I heard you guys talking about getting a speaker on a physical therapist, because probably if there's anything more important than good nutrition in maintaining bones, it's physical activity and exercise, and also for loading your bones to keep them strong, also to keep your balance and to keep your muscles strong. So I'm not going to go on about that, but I'm glad to hear you guys are thinking about that. Uh, so calcium and vitamin D are essential for bone health, as is protein, and others contribute to bone health, but has a lesser impact than calcium, vitamin D, or protein, and most can be obtained from a well-balanced diet. I've given some sources of information 
Um, Dr. Wallace has a blog where he features different nutrients related to bone health and not that are very informative. He also has a TV show and he's very entertaining, but he is a well-respected scientist. And then I mentioned, mentioned uh, grassroots health. And so thank you all for uh, listening and uh, contributing your questions. I hope you enjoy your sources of calcium and vitamin D. And I'm thinking here they're getting sunshine, vitamin D, eating ice cream, getting their calcium, and hopefully they've been shopping so they got some physical activity too. So enough. I, I don't know if we have time for more questions. I'll let that up to Shelly. Thank you all. Oh, that was great. That was wonderful. Uh, very, very helpful uh, in so many ways. I want to thank you, Joan, for your wonderful presentation on all the great information you just shared. Um, I do want to take some, a question or two, but I first want to stop the recording. So thank you once again, and let me go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>